Welcome everyone to the JDS and Sawgrass webinar, School Days, Sublimation Opportunities for Back to School. My name is Holly Locker. I have been with JDS since the beginning of 2011. I come from over 15 years of graphic design experience in the sign industry, print, and web design world. Uh, this will be recorded, so you can access this in the future. It will be archived on our YouTube channel and on Sawgrass's website. And uh, now I want to make a big welcome to Jimmy Lamb, the Manager of Education and Communication of Sawgrass. He will be presenting and explain more on how this will work. So I'll let Jimmy take it away. Thanks, Jimmy. Well, thank you, Holly. It's good to be here, as always. So, okay, as Holly was saying, today's topic is school days. Sublimation Opportunities for a Back to School. And again, my name is Jimmy Lamb with Sawgrass Technologies. Well, it's that time again, back to school. It means the school buses and all that will be rolling soon. But, you know, for you, it's not about the traffic. It's not about getting the kids up early to go to school. It's really about new income opportunities because there's a lot of different opportunities with the school systems. You just have to figure a creative way to get there understand some of the challenges that you're going to run into, and then try to formulate a plan that's going to help you open the door to being able to generate some revenue from this particular source. One of the things I want to make you aware of, and I'll give you a little bit more information when we get to the very end, is we do have for you a free, we like that word, right, free ebook entitled Making Money in the School Market, which is available for download on the internet. It is on the Sawgrass website, uh, something that we've put up recently. It's got a lot of good information. In fact, a lot of what we cover today is like the short version of the book. So the webinar actually follows that book, but we don't cover everything that's in the book or we'd be here for a couple of days. Um, but you can definitely get more information about the things that I'll be talking about today in that book. And at the very end, I will tell you how you can go and download that particular book for your use. So let's start off by defining the school market. And according to the U.S. and Canadian government, there's about 75 million North Americans between the age of 5 and 25. They're currently students of some form or format. And they attend about 80,000 different schools with all kinds of extracurricular and academics uh, and faculty and staff opportunities and just a lot of different things going on in those systems that can make use of decorated products, specifically sublimated products uh, that you can create and deliver to them. But there's a lot of challenges as well, just as I was saying, okay? And then you're going to, you know, it looks good, big numbers there, but you definitely have to focus in to understand the challenges and what you'll be up against getting into the schools. Because of their size and their visibility, the school market gets a lot of attention. That means there's a lot of competition. But the reality is, if you investigate it, you're going to find out that very few schools have any money, except maybe the private ones. Uh, so that becomes an important aspect. If they don't have any money, why are they a good market? Well, <laughs> excuse me, the part of the market that has money is not necessarily the principal's office. Rather, it's the auxiliary groups, things like the athletic boosters or the PTA or the band boosters, You know, maybe even the students themselves. That's where the money is, and that's really where you want to pursue the money. You may find some small budgets within the administration of the school, but typically you're going to find more money in those groups that support the school and look for opportunities to you know, better the schools, better their students and their children along the way. So that's going to be part of that potential is figuring out who is buying what and then be able to present items to them. Now when we break the school market down into segments, we have four. We have the elementary, kindergarten, even preschool segment. We have the middle school, junior high. We have the high school and then we have the college. And we're going to look at each of these four separately and you'll find the same thing in the ebook. these four categories. So let's start with the elementary schools, which I call the fun years, okay, because that's important to understand. Because if you look at a typical elementary school, you see a lot of interaction between parents and students. And at that point in time, the children are still at a fun age, most of them, okay. Um, and because of that, the you'll see parents who are actively involved, and you see a lot of fundraisers, and you go to PTA meetings, and there's typically a lot of people there because they're all interested in interacting. And we see more volunteers at the schools and just generally a better flow there. And we see 
closer bonds between the teachers and the students. Um, and because of the age, we see all kinds of neat things that we can do because those kids are into what I call cutesy. And when they have the cutesy things, that means when we talk about decorated products, we can have some really fun, creative looking things that we put together uh, that's going to appeal to them so that they spend their money. Now, what's the best way in elementary school? Well, there's multiple things you can do there. But I'm a firm believer that one of the best things to do to get into the elementary school is to put together a fundraising program to go and show, ideally the PTA, and we call it kids' artwork. Now, the concept behind kids' artwork is just like it sounds. The kids draw things. We know how good of an artist they can be. They draw things, and then those items can be sublimated onto gift items that the parents can buy. Okay, it's a wonderful thing, and let me tell you what, my oldest is 24 years old, and I still have things that he did way back in kindergarten, okay, so those things stick around. I got things from every child here in the house. Now, one of the top items for sublimation is the coffee mug. We see things like refrigerator magnets. We see things um, like mouse pads. We even see t-shirts occasionally, but the number one item probably is the coffee mugs, but it's really up to you. I mean, you can certainly do this on the, cell, on the cell phone covers as well. Anything that you want to sublimate, you can put the image onto. Now, the key here is the kids draw it, and then an order is placed and delivered to you, including the artwork, and then you have to, of course, process it on wherever it's going to go on. Now, keep in mind uh, some things along the way. Um, a lot of schools, you know, I, I speak from experience here, with our limited budgets, they don't necessarily have a lot of free paper floating around. So, you know, I've seen things come up from school that's like recycled paper, where it's different colors, it's graph paper, and whatever else. So you got to be careful. If you leave it up to them, you have no idea what the kid's going to draw on. You don't want a kid drawing on graph paper, because when you go to take that image and get it electronically into your system so that you can set it up for sublimation, you don't want to have to get rid of all those blasted little lines. So, you know, part of your kid's artwork, you want to keep in mind logistically, supply the paper. Get a really good quality white paper and supply it. That way it's consistent paper coming across to you. Now, how do you get into the system? A lot of people choose to scan it. I actually also like using a really high quality digital camera because the fact that when I'm using a scanner, a lot of times the bright light on the scanner kind of distorts it even a little bit. Whereas I find that I get a better image many times with the digital camera. So you've got to kind of figure out the best way. That's one of your challenges. We've got to get it in, and then we probably have to cut out some of the background. So you're going to have to do a little bit of graphics work here. Okay? But beyond that, we don't have to worry about color management because yeah, we don't have to match a specific color. Uh, the quality can even be a little weird because, well, look at it. You know, their, their image isn't that great to begin with. So we really don't have quite as much pressure on us with the kids' artwork to reproduce some of the things as maybe we do with some things like, you know, people's logos and photographs and that kind of stuff, okay? All right. So the idea is you run this through the PTA. You have to have, you know, enough markup in there where you can make money and they can make money. Uh, and then, of course, you've got to set up your order forms and kind of process it through the right way. But I'm telling you, this is one of the, the best fundraisers because it's not just selling. It's, you know, some of these fundraisers, the kids are going out selling magazine subscriptions and candy, stuff like that. This is so much better because it's providing a memory item for the parents, something that they can remember their kid by every time they look at it, you know. And the, and the parents are going to use that. They're going to use that coffee mug. Or they're going to use these products, and it gives them that nice you know, emotional attachment, which is important because when they have an emotional attachment, they'll pay more money for it, okay? So if you want to charge them $25 for that coffee mug with their kids' artwork on there, they're not buying a coffee mug. They're buying a perpetual memory of their child at that age, okay? Big difference. And you want to keep that in mind when you're starting to put together your pricing on this. Everybody's going to make a buck, but look at the perceived value of the product, not what the product is. That's, you know, very important. Okay. You know, in kindergarten, I mean, I think that's one of the best avenues to go. You may find some awards where you're, you know, they're uh, recognizing teacher of the year, custodian of the year, or something like that. Not a lot of money in that anymore. There used to be a lot more money available. It really depends on the school, okay? Uh, so what I'm getting at is if you're really going to the school and looking for money, you're probably not going to get much in the elementary. But if you can help them with a fundraiser and really put it together the right way, you can have some fun with it. And that's where we're going to, you know, that's where we're going with that. Okay, then that brings us to middle schools. Now, what can you do with middle schools? I'm not a big fan of the middle school market. Some of you might have found some really cool things there. I understand that. The reason I'm not as big a fan of the middle schools is I call it the transition years. 
because that's when you see that the, the kid's starting to want to transition away from being a child and towards an adult. Now, they're not adults. Okay, this is in their mind. Okay, so I mean, you know, we're talking twelve-year-olds here, um, but you know, the, there is. They're they're going through phases of life where they don't want the parents to be quite as involved, and the parents aren't quite as involved, and you know, this it's different. Okay, and, and it been it's different because they're not really finding themselves yet, and because of that, there's not a sense of community necessarily in the school. For example, if you go to school sports in middle schools, sadly, there's not a lot of people there. Okay. You know, one of my daughters played lacrosse, and you know, when I went, it was me and you know six other parents watching them play. And there was more than six kids on the team, but that's it. So you don't see this big outpouring of people with support who want to buy you know the school mascot shirts and everything because well, they're just not really into it. And that's why I call it a tough sell. I mean, there's some school spirit, and every school is a little different. There's definitely some school spirit where you may be able to sell some products, uh, but the parent involvement just really isn't there. But if I'm going to go into a middle school, um, I'm probably going to try to find out who the coaches are for the different teams. And a lot of times in the middle school level, and I speak from my experiences, your, your city and your state could be different. Um, we find that a lot of those coaches are actually volunteer. They were not teachers coaching on the side. They're actually volunteer coaches. And, you know, there's no budget. But what happens is they'll have a team, and they want to buy, say, for the golf team, you know, matching shirts for the, you know, the six kids playing golf. Well, they need somebody to, to fill that order, okay? And they'll pay for it themselves is what I'm getting at. It's not coming through the school. It's coming directly from, you know, the students and the coach and whatnot. And you may find the same thing with the band and, and some of these other groups there in the middle schools. Um, so, you know, there's some opportunity there. Definitely some of the awards and plaques. And, again, a lot of times there's no budget for this. It's just coming out of somebody's pocket. But we start looking with, you know, some nice photo awards that we can do maybe for that level. Um, you'll find some middle schools that have pretty active, you know, sports programs. Uh, but, you know, in, in general, it's sort of a weird place, I hate to say, uh, in the business world. It just haven't done well in that particular um, aspect. Okay, but now we can move into the one that really gets the attention, and that's the high schools. Because when you really get into the high schools, the whole dynamics have changed about who is there and what's going on. Yeah, again, every school is different. Every... Uh, Geographical regions different, so you know what happens at one school may not happen in another. But in general, high schools are much more active in extracurricular activities, and students are finding a sense of identity with that school. So there's a certain level of pride that they want to show off, and in many cases, because they're involved in extracurricular, their parents are going to show that off too, as well. So you know that starts to grow a little bit. So when I'm looking at the high schools, and you know, I'm going to give you a lot of information on high schools because I've been in parental groups looking to raise money for activities. I've had three kids in high school, so you know, I, I know how much money I've spent there. But anyway, uh, but there are a lot of different groups because you get in high school with all the different extracurricular. You got sports, you got band, you got cheerleading, ROTC, you have drama, art, academics. I mean, there's just a lot of different things going on, all um, depending on the size of the school. As well, a lot, or not all, but a lot of their coaching staff is paid, and they have budgets, and they have athletic departments with budgets. So they may be spending money. Not a lot, okay, because they're still looking at boosters to help make up for it, okay? But um, they're certainly, you know, they're with, um, there's certainly opportunities there for um, making some money, okay? Um, so... Let's start with a couple of different areas to go here. Really, I still think and firmly believe that the greatest percentage of income you're going to derive from most schools, and especially high schools, is through some fundraising program. Okay, I spent three years as the president of the Band Boosters for a very active uh, band that toured to go to marching competitions, and we had to annually raise a good twenty thousand dollars. Um, just to cover all the expenses the school did not. So we had very active fundraising programs, and we were always looking for new and different things. Uh, one of the key ones that we had in my uh, kids' high school was selling spirit products at the games, and we're going to talk more about that in just a minute. So going back, though, 
fundraising is what we're talking about here. And what are some of the different opportunities that we can do with fundraising? Well, one of them is what we call action sports photography. And here is where we're capturing pictures of the kids um, in team sports or team events. And then those are being applied to things and, and being able to be sold to the student, to the family, or whatever. And maybe you're in a position where you can do this all turnkey, but most of it probably goes through the athletic boosters. And you take, for example, you can see here the, the, the wooden football plaque. Um, there you got a, a, an image of the, of the kid, and you got uh, some graphics and some text there. And really, if you just sold one of those, the whole team's going to want it. Okay, So you know, if you present it the right way to the athletic boosters, then they have a way of, of offering these things to the students and their families, and they make money, and you make money. Um, so this is what you want to start thinking of being creative. Now, action sports photography is not just the primary football games. We're talking about every event that goes on. We're talking about the cheerleading. We're talking about drill teams. We're talking about marching band. Um, all these things have the opportunity. So it's not really just action sports. It's really just action photography. And it's a great way to capture those years in high school. And, and it's, you know, it's saved forever. I mean, these aren't things that just like disappear when the kid gets out of high school. These are great lifelong memory products. Uh, and you can see they can be applied to all kinds of things. That's the neat thing about sublimation because we got all kinds of plaques and we have photo panels and we have the cell phone covers and uh, we got flip flops and we got acrylics and glass and just you know tons of different things out there that these can all be put on. I mean, as small as bag tags and keychains, which are very popular for this type of thing, all the way up to nice things that can be displayed on the walls, you know, around the home. So definitely have some nice opportunity there. And then we just like the, the spirit in general, because the spirit level is typically pretty strong at most high schools. And that means that people will buy products that have the team name, uh, well, school name, not necessarily team, mascots, colors, you know, all those types of things. And, and this is where you can really go into any school and pitch them as a great fundraiser, just the whole school spirit aspect. Now, going back to what I was mentioning with the band, you know, this is, this is our primary, you know, fundraiser was uh, doing um, spirit type products. You know, football games, a tent out there uh, by the concession booth where we're selling, you know, decorated products with the school mascots and whatnot. Those same things are offered for sale in the school cafeteria. They're offered at other sporting events. It can be offered online. So it's a year-round type of fundraising program for whichever organization you're working through. Okay, so in our case, as band boosters, the band boosters did not want to buy any of their own equipment, so everything was contracted out, obviously, to someone local. But it became, you know, an awesome program for generating money. Um, our particular uh, group, for example, selling T-shirts, um, decent quality T-shirts at that, you know, in the beginning of the school year, could do, you know, pull in ten thousand dollars in the first two weeks of school. So that was big money for us. So this became, you know, a good aspect, and that's one of the things that you want to um, present to them. And and a lot of it is understanding the mentality of what's going on, because when you when you talk about these groups and the things they're doing for fundraisers right now, a lot of it's hard selling, okay? Because everybody's selling the same old junk out there, and people are tired of buying junk, and it makes it that much harder. And you know, when I make a pitch to any of these groups, I mean, I know what they've gone through because I've been, you know, a band booster president. You know, and when I make my pitch to them. Um, I'm typically going in and saying, listen, are you guys tired of the same old, same old when it comes to fundraising? Um, have, you, is it, have you gotten sick and tired of selling uh, candy and magazine subscriptions and pizza dough and cookie dough? And has it gotten so bad that when the kids go out to sell that the neighbors turn off the lights and close the blinds? He said, I know that's true. You know, that's what you hit them with. And then you pull out all your spirit products and you start showing them what you got and, you know, and pitching them on the whole concept. And one of the key concepts, if you ever work with professional fundraising groups, these guys, you know, typically make all the money. Okay, they they come in with a nice, beautiful, glossy, you know, brochure and a package and everything all put together, and you go out and sell it, and they deliver it, and it's done. Okay, so it's a one-shot deal, and they control everything. They say, okay, this is the retail price. This is how much you're going to get. Typically, you get no more than forty percent, and they get sixty percent. Okay, so they're getting all the money, and that's another one of the things that I pitch because what I tell these groups is, listen, you can set your own margin, whatever you want that margin to be. That's up to you, okay? I'll give them suggested retail where they're making at least a 50% margin in there because that's higher than what they were getting for selling pizza dough. Uh, ideally, if I could get them 60, I would, but it's up to them, okay? Because I know what I have to charge them to be able to be profitable 
And then I leave it up to them to whatever they want to mark it up to. See, that's the beauty of it. Okay, They determine the markup, not me. And I pitch that point to them. Now, I have to be competitive enough that they can do a markup. Okay, you got to remember that because you're um, producing it, but then you're wholesaling to them because they have to sell it as a retailer. Um, but that becomes a nice pitch point because they get to decide what they want to sell it for. They get to determine their own margins. So when I'm doing my pitches to them, you know, I point that out, and then I show them what the wholesale price is on everything with suggested retail, and then let them make the decision of what it's going to be. Okay. Uh, now you got to have a good quality kit if you're going to go in and talk to these people. Remember that. I mean, you can see some simple things here on the screen. Uh, here we have. Uh, the Brighton Tigers, you know, part of their group there, which is, uh, you know, a number of different products with the Tiger on there. Um, what you typically want to do is put together a really intensive kit with everything you can possibly think of decorated with a common theme for a common school. Now, you're not going to do that for every school you go to because it costs you a fortune, okay? Uh, so we, we realized that really quick. We also looked at it and said, wait a minute, if we do East Side High and then we go visit West Side High, and they're like arch rivals, that's not good either, okay? Because they don't want to see a sample kit for the other guys. So we, to be safe, we created our own um, sample kit based on a fictitious high school that we created. So we created the name of the school, the mascot, everything, the colors, create a whole kit for it that we can show anywhere and everywhere that we go. So we always walked in with a nice professional kit to show people. And then we may have one or two products pre-made you know, with their mascot or whatever to kind of, you know, entice them a little bit. Leave it as a freebie so they can look it over. Uh, so there's a lot of things you got to put together in there to make that work. But, you know, at the end of the day, with school spirit, I mean, there's so many different things out there for sublimation, you know, from water bottles to T-shirts to cell phone covers. I mean, there's just a wide range. And we did find at the retail level that, you know, you have such a diverse socioeconomic range of students that we were offering low-end things and high-end things, okay, be able to cover everybody. So, you don't make a lot of money off a of bag tag, but you can make a lot of money off a of high quality, you know, apparel item. Uh, you make a lot of money off of a, you know, a cell phone case. So, you know, there were there was a range of products there to make it all work, so we can actually make some money out of it. You also have what we call targeted school spirit programs. You know, a general spirit program is typically setting up some type of retail business operation or helping them do it. They're the ones that are doing it. You're just providing. Okay. Uh, but you do have targeted spirit programs where you can go in and target, you know, specific of the band or certain teams. And, you know, so many times people are on in the high school level, they're, they're chasing the big teams, you know, the football and the basketball. But I'm telling you what, if you go look at like the golf team, you know, golfers, they're sort of a preppy bunch, you know, and they're into uh, things like, um, you know, performance polos. Okay, because they're used to performance products. You know, they like that kind of stuff. They want, you know, bags to carry their equipment in. Um, you know, they buy things because they know they're sort of like underdogs in the sports world of the school. They buy a lot of different things. It says, I'm the golf team. And let's face it, you know, kids that know how to play golf, they didn't learn it playing jungle golf. They learned it on a golf course somewhere. So they probably got parents that have a little higher income anyway, you know, so that they can afford that. Same thing with the tennis team and the swim team. I mean, there's lots of different groups out there that there's no budget for them. And they end up buying their own. But um, not only can you sell them items, you know, to promote what they do, but uh, you can, you know, add that spirit flavor to it as well. And then, you know, also... Even the bigger teams, you know, like football team, you're not gonna you're not gonna be doing sublimated uniforms for the for the teams. You may for the soccer team, but you're not gonna be doing it for most of the teams. But most of them have some type of travel apparel that they wear. Okay, so they all dress alike when they travel, and that's something you can look into being able to produce. And remember, sublimation, poly performance apparel, poly performance is what most of their uniforms are made of. These kids know what poly performance is. Um, and they do like that higher quality stuff. And you'll definitely find it with the smaller teams where, you know, the kids are paying for themselves. If the school's trying to pay for it, they're going to want something dirt cheap. But if the actual is coming from the parents or whatever, it might be a little different. One of the things with the Mar Mar marching band is the students all had to buy uh, T-shirts. They all had to buy polo shirts. Uh, the drum line had to buy special outfits and all this stuff in addition to the uniforms they wore in the competitions. And, uh, you know, that actually became a bit of a fundraiser for that, uh, the band boosters too going through us. Then we got all these different awards programs. You know, at the end of the year, most of these organizations have um, award banquets. You know, in fact, a lot of the money that are raised by these organizations goes to the awards banquet. Uh, you know, every year, the, the, our band boosters had a, uh, an awards banquet, and we gave out a lot of awards, and someone got to produce those awards 
Okay, and the athletic boosters did it as well, and so did some of the other organizations. So, getting your foot in the door, one you know, one thing can lead to a whole lot more. I mean, maybe because you're already an awards producer, you're already got your foot in the door for doing the awards, and you go the other direction. You know, you're now getting into sublimation. You add in the spirit and the fundraiser, but maybe you're starting with the fundraiser and it leads to awards. So, there's a lot of different ways you can go. And again, for these organizations, most of them have a budget because they're generating their own funds and they are buying these kind of things. You may find school stores, especially at the high school level. In fact, some high schools have very sophisticated stores where they're teaching the kids business principles. And, um, you know, they are actually selling merchandise, marketing merchandise, learning how to do that. And, you know, there may be some opportunities. I've seen some very impressive things at some of the schools along the way. And a lot of them don't have anything. And as I mentioned, you know, athletic uniforms, you're probably not a lot of uniforms you're going to do, but keep in mind that travel clothing, okay? The travel clothing becomes a really nice aspect. But definitely with the smaller teams, you may actually be able to produce their uniforms because they don't have necessarily a very specific uniform or uniform company to go to. Okay, that takes us over to the college and the community years. Definitely when the kids get into college, they're developing their own world. Okay, they're living in their own, it's like living in their own town, you know, a decent sized university. Um, except the parents get taxed <laughs> instead of the students. So you, when you go into that, you know, it, like bigger universities become really diverse because things are all spread out. But when you go here, it's different, okay? Because the, the first thing that happens in the so-called spirit aspect of schools is merchandise is sold. And there's a lot of money made on merchandise from a lot of universities. And typically because of that, universities are engaged in something called licensing. And with licensing, what they're doing is they're controlling their image, their brand, um, their intellectual property. And you can't just randomly start reproducing their mascots and whatnot without having a license. So licensing is an important aspect. Now, if you're working internally to a school, you typically don't need a license, but you need to make sure that whoever you're working with actually has authority to hire someone to produce things with, you know, the um, mascots and whatnot, okay? Uh, even fraternities and sororities have some licensing there. I mean, traditionally they didn't, but you're seeing a lot more of that in place now, so you never assume you can just do it. There's actually a website where you can go to that's like fraternity licensing.com, something very close to that. You can Google it and find it. That will give you more information about what you can and can't do there without the proper credentials. Okay, so how do you get a license? Well, most of the licensing is handled by a company called Collegiate Licensing, which is clc.com will get you there. And the big universities, the major universities, you've got to go in there, you've got to apply, provided you get accepted, you've got to pay up front fees, you've got to pay royalties and everything that you sell. And it's actually complex. I mean, anybody can get a license, I will tell you that. But you have to have a strategy because what they look at is they want to make more money. They want to increase the revenue that's coming into the school. So if you just try to get a general license because you want to do some of the same old, same old that other people are doing, it generally doesn't bring new revenue to the school. It just dilutes the existing revenue. And these are questions that they actually ask you. Why is your product unique? Would an existing fan of the school buy your product instead of a different product or buy your product in addition to everything else they're selling? So you see, they want to know that. So you know, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, you can learn more there at that website. Uh, every school sets their own rates, um, average entry fees, um, $800 or so on up, average royalties, 6 to 8% of the gross selling price at retail level. Okay? And there's a lot of things you've got to do. You've got to tag it and everything else. You've got to track it. And when you get a license, you don't have a blanket license. So they'll give you a license to reproduce one logo, one very specific logo that they will specify the colors and everything else uh, on one specific product. So it's, it's pretty tight, okay? So I tell people, I said, if you want to go into licensing, don't worry about the UCLA's and the Duke universities of the world. Go look at the smaller universities, okay? And it, a lot of them do their own licensing internally. Uh, for example, with one of the local universities here in North Carolina, that has about 15,000 students. I have a license that costs me $200 a year, and there is no royalties on it. Now, they're very specific about what I can and can't do, and I had to go through the application process, but hey, I pay them once a year, and I can reproduce their mascot on anything I want and sell it to anybody I want. 
Okay, so um, you know I was able to do that. Um, also, I have done work for university bookstores where you don't need a license because it's a branch of the university. Now, just be careful with that because some bookstores are not a branch of the university. If they're privately owned, you will need a license. In all likelihood, if they're part of the university, you probably don't. So the bookstores are probably a good place to start. Go to the actual college bookstore itself because they sell a tremendous amount of spirit products there, you know, aimed at the students and the parents of the students. And that's a good place to always get started. Um, they tend to be a little competitive, so you want to make sharpen your pencil when you go in. The key is to go in there and show them something uniquely different than what they already have because that's going to interest them more than anything else that you can do. When you go to the Greeks, um, you know, these are student-run organizations, but they have national chapters behind them. And it's good to check into before you approach any particular fraternity or sorority. You may want to go to their chapter national headquarters and see if they have information there about licensing. And again, I think there's a licensing agency. Someone told me about it, and it's something like a fraternitylicensing.com or else greeklicensing.com might be it. So check check those out, okay? Because I don't, you know, you'll go in with well-meaning students who just think that they can buy anything they want with, you know, whatever on it, and that may not be the case. You don't want to have to get in trouble over that. So kind of find out what's going on there. Um, but if you can certainly get in and do it the right way, there's lots of opportunities there because it costs money to be in a, um, you know, fraternity and sorority, and they're proud of it, and they tend to spend a lot of money on it, and you know, buy a lot of products. So you definitely have an avenue that you can go there. Listen, I know people who put themselves through college by selling t-shirts out of the trunks of cars or they did screen printing or something, you know, in a dark room late at night and sold it to the other kids. So anyway, um, again, you know, in a big, you know, um, level college, you're not going to be doing any of the uh, uniforms for sports and whatnot, but they have a lot, a lot, a lot of extracurricular groups small independent organizations, and those tend to have some um, possibilities. Now keep in mind that some of these extracurricular groups in the university are not part of the university franchise itself, and therefore they may not have permission to actually reproduce the mascot of the school, something that has to be looked into. Okay, So when you find out that there is a um, French club at a given university, that doesn't mean they can automatically put the mascot on their shirts or their cell phone covers or whatever it is that they're doing. Okay. So those are those four main marketplaces, sort of a brief introduction to it. But, but let's talk about some of the other things that go with it. I mean, there's some of the different ideas you can go. But there's other things that you need to keep in mind as we're going. So we're going to talk about some of the challenges and precautions beyond what I've already mentioned to you, um, you know, to keep aware of. Because the key here is for you to build a sales and marketing plan to go after whatever school group you want. So the more you know about them, the better off you are. You know, so you're better prepared so that you can you know, maximize the return on your investment in time. Um, as I said from the very beginning, is you're probably working with some type of auxiliary support group in most cases that is not part of the legal school system necessarily, okay? More of a support group. Now, you may work through the school occasionally, and that's fine, but a lot of times you're working with those particular groups. But let's start with the actual schools itself. If you actually do get something with a school, okay? You want to first of all make sure the person placing the order has the authority to do so because you got a lot of well-meaning people. By the way, someone just said it's greeklicensing.com. Thank you, Kristen. Um, it is greeklicensing.com. Check that out okay, before you go to any fraternities. All right, so you want to make sure the person placing the authority has the authority, excuse me, placing the order has the authority to do so. Uh, most school systems work through a PO process, which can be long and drawn out and aggravating, okay? Um, and even if a PO is not required, and it probably is, you want to make sure you have some form of sales contract that specifies all the details of the job because when you're dealing with government bu bureaucracy, somebody's going to audit something and you want to make sure it's all spelled out the right way. Um, so anyway, uh, you want to make sure that everything is identified, lined up correctly the right way. You also want to be careful of things, and this can be whether it's directly with a school or with a sport organization. Watch out for a 100-piece order that turns into 10 orders of 10 pieces. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times people say, we want to order 100 of these, so we gave them a price on 100, assuming you're getting 100, and then all of a sudden you're getting 10 here one week and 10 the next week. Because what they did was they went out and put the order system out of the kids, and they're real slow to return it, and it comes trickling in. And that's not a 100-piece order anymore. It doesn't deserve the 100-piece price break. 
okay? And, and that's important. You've got to make that sure they understand up front. If I give you a 100-piece price, you have to order 100 at a time to make it work, okay, or you don't get to keep that price. Um, we've seen some where they just weren't going as a profit motive, so they wanted the kids to write the checks to us. Really? You want to collect 100 individual checks on that order and have to process them all and hope that they're none of them bounce? <clears throat> You want that organization, if people are, are paying to buy it at all possible, you want them to collect the money and then reissue one check to you. Um, also, when you're dealing directly with a school, again, being part of a government agency, be careful that sometimes giving somebody a freebie as an incentive gift or a thank you or whatever could get them in trouble, okay, because it's seen as like a bribe or something. So, Because um, a lot of times what I like to do to get something started, especially, you know, with a small business is I go and put their logo on something and go give it to them as a freebie to get them started, you know, just to get their attention. Can you do that with school? You got to be careful, you know, you don't want to get anybody in trouble. And they may not know that they're going to get in trouble either. So, you know, just some things you want to be aware of. Now, when you go and work with support groups, you got to be really careful here because a lot of these support groups are not legal entities. So when I took over as Band Booster president of our local high school, Band Booster organization been around, I don't know, 20 years at least. They had um, an employer identification number. They had a bank account. They had checks. They had bylaws. They had officers. They had everything in the world except one thing, a legal structure. They were not a legal entity. They were not a nonprofit tax-exempt organization like everybody thought. So when you see Smith High School band boosters, everybody thinks, well, you know, I can donate money to it, and it's tax deductible. And not if it doesn't have, uh, if it doesn't have the IRS official nonprofit tax exempt um, stamp of approval on it per se it's not a, a true charity type of organization then you know typically it's not really tax deductible and there's all kinds of things going on there uh, and not only is it from a tax perspective but if it's not a legal entity and you have problems about getting paid who do you go after okay because it's not a legal entity it's a group of parents who are all joined together because their kids are in the band together working under a set of bylaws, but they don't really have a legal structure. So then you have to ask who's in charge, you know, because there's no legal structure to kind of define that. So it's a little troublesome. By the way, I learned how to form tax-exempt nonprofit corporations as a result, and that's one of the things that I did to actually get it up to what I would consider being important. Okay, so what I'm getting at is, you know, you need to understand that structure because for states that charge sales tax, what are the rules? Yeah, and it's different in every state, okay, but what are the rules? I mean, do you have to charge these people sales tax or not? They think, oh, no, we're, we're a school organization. You don't charge us sales tax, really? Yeah, that may not be true, and then that gets you in trouble later. And, of course, you want to make sure, again, you have all the sales contracts. People have the authority to do things. Like I said before, watch out for that 100-piece order. It turns into 10 orders of 10. Okay, also keep in mind that with school um, entities, school-related entities, officers typically change out in July of each year. Promises the outgoing board made might not be honored by the incoming board. So make sure that if in the spring they're setting up to do a spirit fundraiser in the fall, that you get it all set up and you get the paperwork in place and contracts, and, and then you want to remind them that they need to tell the incoming board what they've done. Okay, That's an important aspect. And also important for you because you also have to realize that you want to find out who the new officers are. If you're doing business with them, you want to, they're usually going to have their elections about April. You want to find out who the new officers are and get to know them so that you have a nice, easy transition. Um, just as important when you're dealing with school groups, a lot of times these booster groups are planning six months in advance, okay, so that the new group can hit the ground running instead of having to figure out their own fundraisers. So a lot of times you're planning the fall in the spring, and in the spring you're, uh, in the, you're planning the fall in the spring, and you're planning the spring in the fall, okay. So this is August 1st. School start up this month. It may be tough to get in some of the things for the fall. Don't get discouraged. Start thinking about the spring. You know, a lot of these things still work in the spring. That's the beauty of it. Keep in mind, professional fundraisers, they typically have a very finite lifespan. This, they're going to do it every 30 days and it ends. You know, when you start doing things like spirit fundraisers, they can go on year-round. That's the beauty of it. So it's constant money coming in. So these are just some of those challenges you got to keep in mind because this is what you're going to be dealing with when you get into the schools. Okay. So, well, let's wrap things up here, um, and I'm um, actually going to bring Holly back in because JDS has 
several different things here that may help you out that uh, we want you to be aware of. Holly, are you back? Hey, Jamie. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, we have a new Premier Custom Color uh, catalog that we just came out with. It has all of our sublimation items in there um, and is on a nice glossy catalog. You can purchase those already made. You can download them and we even have a matching um, website that you can go to as well. You can send your customers to. And for the webinar special, one of the webinar specials we have today, you can buy 25 and get 25 free. And that will go on through August 16th. So basically that would give you the ability to have a nice full color brochure professionally made so that when you do go in and, and work with groups like these school boost organizations, you have something to show them and actually leave behind as a sales tool. Yep, and then um, we also have the, I think if you have it, the booster, we actually have created a booster club fundraiser brochure. Yep. And that, we're doing the same deal with that. You buy 25, get 25 free, or you, you can download it off our website. Um, there is a matching form that is a PDF form that you can fill out all the information for the fundraiser group and set your own um, price margins in there. And this is actually version two. This is our brand new version um, that now includes all the iPhone cases and our coolers and, and some other of our new products in it. Yeah, see that's a great tool right there because again, um, one of the things if you're trying to do any kind of fundraising is you need to look professional because you are competing against professional groups that already have the glossy brochures. So this gives you that extra glossy brochure to be able to go in and put down and people look at you and say, oh yeah, they're, they, they know what they're doing, they're professional, they put this together. So that's a great tool there. I'm, I'm really pleased to see that you guys have that going. It costs too much when I have to make them myself, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, we I think that a lot you, of work um, into it. Yep, you did. You also have some specials on some equipment, I believe. Yeah. Um, for anybody who needs a new printer, sublimation printer, um, we have some package deals. Um, the Rico 3110 package we have for $495. Um, that will also be through the 16th of August. You do have to mention that webinar code, the WebNR0813. <laughs> I like that spelling. Our Webner. <laughs> yes. Well, WebNR. Yeah. See, it works. WebNR. So. Yes, web and R. <laughs> um, we also have the 7,700 sets on a special deal as well. We have the set one, which has the 29 milliliter smaller carts. The, that is going to be 11.99, and the set two, which has the larger cartridges for 60 milliliters, that is 14.49. So if you need a new printer or you're getting into sublimation, this is a, a really great savings. Yeah, absolutely. And that Rico 77 is my favorite printer because I like being able to do big stuff like for apparel. Okay, so the other thing that I wanted to make mention, I mentioned at the beginning and make mention again, is that uh, at Sawgrass we do have our Making Money in the School Market book, and this was just a small part of that. When you get into that, we actually have templates in there. We have all kinds of product suggestions in there. We have a lot of detail in there when you go and read this. And this is a free ebook that can be downloaded, um, and the place that you would go is um, to Sawgrass website, which is sawgrassinc.com. And once you're there, look for a tab that says Education and Events, and uh, click on that. And let's see if I can jump out of this screen over there real quick. And look, I got Sean's name, you know, because Sean was on this last time. <laughs> I'm sorry, Holly. Um, I thought I changed that to your name. So here, let's get rid of that screen. Um, <laughs> so give me one second. Let me see if I can pull up for you real quick um, where that would be. And... Because this is worthy of downloading, you know. I mean, it's free and it's got so much information in it. And that's that's our goal. Okay. Yeah, so, I've seen that book. It's really awesome. I it's really informational. So if you go to the Sawgrass website, which is Sawgrass Inc. I N K dot com, and you click on Education and Events, and if you look down there, you'll see Making Money in the School Market, right there. 
And if you click on that, it'll tell you where to go from there and um, how to download that. Now, I will tell you the first time you go in, what you're doing is you're accessing our archives. And every time you, the first time you go in the archives, you do have to fill a little form to get in there, but it's free. There isn't a charge for it. And then you'll get a password and you can come in and out all you want all day long. So you'll find that in there. You can download it and do whatever you want with it. And uh, that's just one of those extra things we wanted to make to, uh, you know, offer out to you to help you out if this is a, a market that you want to go into. Okay, so we have several questions. So let me uh, switch over here to the question screen and see what we have here. Uh, have you heard of any phone cases being made for phones other than the iPhone 4 and 5? Um, there are some cases out for the galaxies. And I think you're going to see more and more. Um, one of the problems is, you know, iPhone, well, kind of like the Model T, they're all the same, more or less. Where then when you go into the Androids, everybody's got their own versions. So um, it's, you know, in other words, the buying is spread out over so many different models that the people making the blank covers haven't invested a lot of money yet in all the different brands. But they do watch and see what the bigger, you know, selling ones are. And I know that they're out there for the Galaxy. And I think some more are going to be appearing. You just kind of got to search a little bit for it. Because not everybody has an iPhone, including me. What is the normal markup for the elementary school levels? Um, you know, there isn't really, a, per se, a normal markup. It depends on the product that you're selling. If you take, for example, we're just talking about the cell phone covers. And let's say you were selling iPhone covers with kids' artwork. An average iPhone cover, blank, it's something like, I'm going to say $3 for easy math. It's like three twenty-five or something. Um, sublimation ink is 0.01 cents per square inch. So if you take something that's as small as an iPhone cover, you're talking 15 cents or so to decorate it. So you got 315 in it. Let's say you have $2 labor and overhead. You got 515 in it. This guy's going to sell it for $25. I mean, you can sell it to them for 1250 and they can double it. Okay. But, uh, there's a lot of different ways you can go with that. And, and part of it for me is I try to make it appealing to them if I'm going to get enough quantity from me out of it. So, you know, I would love to always be able to double it. And some things I can double or maybe even triple, but, you know, they got to mark it up and sell it. So, you know, double is really the extreme probably for what you're going to be able to do. Again, you got to look at the intrinsic value, the perceived value of the end product, look at your cost to produce it, figure out what it can be sold for, and then kind of work backwards from that. Uh, what is the typical profit margin for a fundraiser for a supplier? If you look at the professional ones, most of them, they get 40%, you get 60%. Okay. Um, so the concept, as always, try to pitch it to them and let them set their own margins. Okay, Then that way they're actually more conscious of what they're selling and how they're selling it. Where can you get the high quality artwork? A lot of times the school don't even have the artwork. That's true. Um, a lot of schools just use generic mascots, and that means you can find them. Uh, you're going to pay for them. Don't go look for free clip art because free clip art has a lot of licensing issues anyway. Um, you know, I look at things like uh, several good websites, uh, Great Dane Designs, which is like Great Dane the dog, okay? Great Dane, D-A-N-E, Designs. Um, he has some really interesting stuff, but not necessarily true mascots, you know, so that's a place to look. Action Illustrated has um, a lot of mascots there. Uh, and then there's even websites like iStockphoto.com, Getty Images. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different ones that sell professional quality graphics, clip art, photographs, that type of thing. And they don't cost much to buy. You're basically buying a license to use it. So read the licensing agreements to understand what you can do with it. Do you know of anywhere to get a general sales contract that can be used as a reference to create my own and or take to my lawyer to polish? Probably should just start with your lawyer. Um, you can find things like that online. There's plenty of websites, and a lot of them are legal websites, to be honest. But there's a lot of websites that will offer you free generic uh, contracts, and then they're trying to give you a pitch to come to them to let them finalize it. So I'm saying it's like you know, some of these legal sites. That's where I would go and look. Um, and then maybe you go to like the lawyer, which is always a good thing, let them make sure, you know, all the little details are 
covered. How much are the flyers and catalogs, Holly? Um, the flyers are twenty-five cents each, and then the catalogs. Um, there's twenty-five to a, a case if you buy just. Less than case, they're dollar twenty-five. But if you buy a whole case, they're ninety-nine cents each. Okay. Um, where can we find peasant tops, dresses, and cutesy clothes other than T-shirts to sublimate? Um, the sublimation world has been, or many suppliers of the world, have been a little slow to expand beyond things like t-shirts. We are starting to find some other things um, out there. There are a few, but not a lot, of clothing manufacturers now who are starting to put out some other things. Okay, It's one of these things where you have to go search a little bit. A good place to go is a fairly large. You can find one of the large trade shows like the imprinted sportswear shows you'll find more apparel people there than some of the other shows. Um, for example, LAT um, offers you know some children's products and this, that, and the other that can be sublimated. Uh, but it's going to take a little while to expand out. So um, you just have to kind of keep looking. I just can't give you just a ready-made source for everything you want, sadly. Uh, the average ink cost for sublimation is 0.01 cents per square inch. And it's actually, for most of the printers, it's less than that, but it rounds up to that because it's something bizarre like 0.0083 cents. So you just round it to 0.01. Uh, the current covers for iPhones do not protect the phones. Do you see new covers coming out that have raised size to protect the phones? Well, keep looking because I've been seeing these covers changing as they've been coming out. So I've already seen differences in some of the covers over the last six months. Um, I would try to see what the most up-to-date you know, covers look like. Uh, Joe, you have a pretty big question there. You know what? I'm going to suggest that you actually contact Holly because what Joe is looking at, Holly, is he is a laser engraver, new to sublimation, and he's trying to find a good way to explain to his customer in basic terms that anybody can understand what sublimation is. And uh, because you guys work with that all day long, I think you know he should give you a uh, a call or an email and let's see if I can get Sean's email back up there so we can tell people what yours is because <laughs> you know I can change it right now because you are mine is Holly L Holly L see I fixed there you while go. everybody's watching so that's not Sean <laughs> that's Holly see so contact Holly and let her give you you know some pointers on that I've kind of helped explain it and uh, I think that'll help you out I'm looking for Sawgrass Inc. for my Epson Stylus Pro 4000 and dual CMYK firmware. Um, that particular line of printers has been discontinued. There are still inks available for, I think, the 4000, but I'm not positive. Don't want to get myself in trouble. Um, what I would suggest that you do is if you visit the Sawgrass website, which we were just at a minute ago, sawgrassinc.com, um, you can go to, well, best thing to do, to be honest with you, is go to the website and contact our tech support tell them what you got and they'll tell you what's available but if you do want to look for yourself first go to tech support on our website you go down to Sublegets IQ I'm sure you can remember all this right okay <laughs> click tech support click Sublegets IQ at the very bottom you'll see the Epson 4000 series and you can go there and see you know what's available to that and way of drivers and inks and all that kind of stuff but I would still suggest you contact tech support on that Why does that keep coming up? We I can double check on that too if they want to email me. Um, yeah. 
I have access to that as well. I think that one has been discontinued, but I'd, I'd have to double check for sure. Yep. Okay, just, uh, what is the cost of a good heater? I'm presuming that's a heat press. Um, Holly, what brand of heat press do you carry? We carry George Knight heat press. Oh, I love George Knight. So, um, like the DK20, what's the price on that one? Do you know off the top of your head? Uh, 1392 That's a great, great heat press. And it, it really that's is. I know, I know there's a little bit of a price point there, but that thing will last forever. And uh, it's a great press. And, and the reality in the world of sublimation, you have to have consistent temperature, consistent pressure, or it will mess up the image. And a lot of times people buy these really cheap heat presses and they don't get good imaging because the heat press is not providing consistent temperature and pressure. So make that investment. It will last you forever. Does JDS have templates available for sublimation products? I'm guessing like the art templates that help you line up your graphics when you're setting them up. Oh, yes. We, um, we have templates for all of our products online. Um, just have them email me and I can tell them where those are. Okay. They're Perfect. actually on our, our FDP site. Excellent. You, do, you guys have a lot. That's the thing. There's a lot of stuff on the JDS website if you go looking for it you know, and start digging Yeah, sometimes in there. it's a little hard to find, so never yep. hesitate to ask us where things are. Yep. Well, there's a, still a couple of questions, but some of these questions um, are really good for the the support team of which Holly is a member there and I would suggest that you see Holly's email there um, if we didn't get to your question to go ahead and just um, maybe email her and she can help you out with that especially when it's applications and techniques and things of that nature and uh, being the top of the hour we're gonna go ahead and wrap things up um, as Holly told you earlier this was recorded so it will be available on the JDS site this is where you'll go to find this on the JDS site. Um, probably it, it takes usually a couple of days to go through the process and getting it over to them. So, Holly, I want to thank you for having me out. I always enjoy a chance to to do a webinar and share with your customer base, and uh, and I look forward to participating again in the near future. All right, thanks, Jimmy, and I. I just want to thank everyone again for attending. And obviously, you have my email if you need any, if you have any further questions, or you can also call us on our one eight hundred number. It's eight hundred eight four three eight eight five three, and you can ask for any of the sublimation specialists. We have Jerica, Sean, and Lisa, as well as myself. And I'll just do a quick uh, mention that we also have an upcoming seminar. Um, if we have anybody in Canada, we're having a seminar next week in Toronto, Canada. It's on Thursday and Friday. And then in October, we're having one in the Phoenix area, October 17th and 18th. So if you have any other questions, um, please email me and let me know. So thanks again. Thanks, Jimmy, so much for presenting this information. And hopefully we'll do another one soon.